Well, hello, everybody. <clears throat> it's good to be with you here today. Considering what all is coming down the pipeline, it's just good to be here with you today. Um, I'm excited about today. I have several things I want to share with you from the Word about the third chapter of Revelation. Uh, for those of you that might just happen to be seeing this and passing by, we are doing um, a study of the book of Revelation, and uh, we've already completed chapters one and two, and today we're going to do chapter three. I, I fully intend to finish chapter three today because uh, chapter four, chapters four and five is a whole nother party going on, so um, I'm not going to do uh, one of the chapters next Thursday. I'm going to, with everything that we've got going on in our world today, um, I'm going to wait, and I'm not going to plan to do one next Thursday. So I'm going to finish three today, and like I said, uh, four and five starts a whole new ball game. So um, we're going to finish three, and um, and then I'll let you know perhaps the next Thursday if all goes well. I'm not really sure. We'll just see. We'll see what happens. But um, I have a very sober feeling today. Um, I've walked with the Lord a lot of years, and um, I have become accustomed to the when the anointing is there and when it's not, when, um, when there is, um, how do I say it, when there is a... a a dark overcast, and um, I feel that today. I feel I feel somewhat of a dark overcast today in my spirit. The joy of the Lord is still there because that dark overcast never takes away from the joy of the Lord, and that must be there because the joy of the Lord is your strength, and if you don't have the joy of the Lord, you won't have any strength, so you have to choose to have the joy of the Lord in order to maintain your strength to walk through places like we're walking through today. Um, most of you know, because you're on my Facebook, that um, Heather and I are going to do a call tomorrow night. And the, the specific reason that we're going to do the call tomorrow night is because she had multiple calls about people saying, I just now found out about this. I, I, I want to know what's going on. I have had multiple people contact me saying, can you please send me the documents? And the documents are no good without attending the class because the documents are not notes like you would take in a class. They're just like an outline. And all you've got is a few words uh, in an outline. And then Heather explains the outline. So we are going to have a class tomorrow night, 6 o'clock Central, and uh, it's going to be geared primarily for those who have not been to the class before. Of course, anybody can join. You always learn something new. With as much information as Heather gives out, um, you always learn something new. And she will include current events as well. So uh, we are going to have the class tomorrow night. And then I'm probably going to disappear for a little while, maybe a week or so, and just see what happens. Um I may do a few posts on Facebook, but I'm I'm going to be watching and preparing even more. I'm I'm fully prepared. I feel, but there's a few last minute things I want to do. So it is coming down. It is coming down the pipeline, and I want to make sure that I don't leave anything undone that the the Lord has has moved upon my heart to do. So I'm going to pray, and then after I pray, we're going to get right into chapter three some powerful things in chapter 3. Lord Jesus, we love you today. God, I need you today. I need your help. I need your anointing. I need your power. I need revelation today, Father. Because God, I realize above all people that I am what I am by the grace of God and nothing else. I, real, I realize, Father, above everything, that if you don't give this to me, I don't have it. It comes from the Holy Spirit. And I'm asking 
you, Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, visit us today. Be here with us as we study the Word of God and as we delve into what God had to say through Jesus and then through John to us. Because, God, we know that these churches, we know what is being spoken to these churches is being spoken to us today. And we do realize that. So help us, God. We ask you to help us today to move and, and hear and speak with only your anointing, with only your interpretation, with only your admonition, Father. I just ask that in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay. I hope you have your Bibles. You are going to need a Bible and a notebook and um, a pen because I'm going to... I'm going to do a lot of, of reading today, a lot of word today. We are going to do chapter 3, and I'm going to talk briefly about each verse as we go through chapter 3. It's a short chapter. It's not a very long chapter. And then we're going to move to Matthew 24. I have asked the Lord um, to help me to know when to bring in Matthew 24, because Matthew 24 is a strong, powerful book that correlates with Revelation, so, I mean, chapter. So, we're going to, after we read chapter 3 of Revelation, we're going to Matthew 24, and then after I finish Matthew 24, I have some notes that I'm going to share with you about some of these verses in Revelation. So, here we go. And unto the angel of the church of Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God, now, we learned in, ver in chapter 1, verse 4, it says, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you, and grace from him which is, which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits. So, we realize that these seven spirits are coming from Jesus to minister to these people. So, that's the way John starts out chapter 3. Uh, saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Now, go back to 120 and you'll see who the seven stars are. It says, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The, golden, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Now, John is writing to the angels of these churches and saying, if you don't do this, Jesus said, God said, I'm going to remove your candlestick. So these angels are important. John doesn't anywhere in Revelation allude to the fact that he's speaking to the leader of a church, a pastor, any human person in these churches. He, everything he's saying, he's saying to the angel of that church. Um. Finish up with, chapter, with verse 1. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, and that thou livest. Let me go back. And I know thy works, that thou has, hast a name, that thou livest, and art dead. Do you know what that means? Have you ever heard the verse in the Bible that says um, that they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof? Do you know how many churches today have a form of godliness, but they have no power? They still have the programs. They still have um, the suppers. They still have the teachings. They still have the sermons. They have this form of godliness. I know that thou hast a name that thou live, that you live. In other words, people say, oh, you should come to our church. Oh, you should come hear what our pastor has to say. But what the Spirit is saying to this angel here is, I know that people think that about this church at Sardis. But I'm telling you right now, you're dead. You do not live. You have a reputation that you are alive, but you do not live. Verse 2, be watchful. And strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. What he's saying here is you're dead. 
But there's just a few things left that are not completely gone. Would you agree that that's where a lot of churches are today here? Is that the majority of what they do is dead works? But there's a few aspects of what they do that still has some life, some Jesus life in it. So what he's telling this church here is be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. He's saying, if you don't do what I'm telling you to, if, you're, if you don't stop what you're doing and start watching in the spirit realm and strengthen those things that are not completely dead but are ready to die, then you're going to be completely dead. There will be no hope for you. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. This means they're in trouble. This means they're in trouble. Verse 3. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. How many pastors do you hear today that will stand up in the pulpit and will say to his congregation, I know y'all are doing some good things. I know we've got some good things going on here, but you folks have got some things in your life that ought not to be. So I'm telling you this morning, you need to repent. How many pastors you think say that on Sunday morning? That's what the angel, that's what the spirit is saying to the angel here in Revelation. This is what John is writing down saying, this spirit is saying to you, angel, you tell this church that they need to repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Now, y'all, this verse is one of the verses that has been used to talk about the church doctrine of rapture, that we've got to be ready because we don't know the hour in which he's going to come. I want you to notice something, and we're definitely going to talk more about this when we get in Matthew 24. I want you to look at something. He's not saying this to the righteous people. He's not saying this to those that are, that are walking with him, that are walking with a pure heart. He's saying them to the, this to those who are not watching. He's saying this to the people in this church that are about dead, that need to repent. He is saying, if therefore thou shalt not watch, if you're just going to go on with these programs and these plans and these once a week happenings, if you're not going to watch, if you're not going to call on me, and if you're not going to tune in to what's really going on and watch, then I will come on thee as a thief. Do you remember the parable of the ten virgins? They were all ten virgins. They all ten had lamps. And only five of them got to go with the bridegroom when he came. Do you know why the other five didn't go? They were virgins. They had lamps. They were thought they were ready to go. Well, what happened when the bridegroom came? They were not watching. They did not have oil for their lamps. Those of you that have been watching me for a long time, you remember how you get oil? Every time that you choose to watch, to do something in the spirit that says, um, okay, I'm going to I'm going to choose spirit instead of flesh. That's how you buy your oil. It's going to cost you. It will cost you something in the flesh to live in the spirit. But you have to be watching or you'll miss the bridegroom. He'll come like a thief in the night and you'll be left behind. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. In other words, there's a few people in your church, Sardis, that are true that love me with all their heart. There's a few names there. There's a few folks there. I wager to say that in almost every church in America, there are people who love Jesus with all their heart, who love Jesus with all their heart. They've not defiled their garments. They study the word of God. They pray to God. 
They do everything they know to do to walk with God. Those are the ones that this scripture right here is talking about. I know there's a few names that have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Wouldn't you love to be that one in that church that Jesus says that about? That he says about you that you have not defiled your garments? That you have, that you have loved him with all your heart? That you're walking with pureness of heart? You're walking in white and that you are worthy? Verse 5, he that overcometh, y'all, <laughs> I'm going to say it probably a million more times. Not to he that says a prayer, not to he that pays tithes, not to he that uh, drives a bus at church, not to he that signs a card, not to he that does any of these things, but to he that overcometh. Do you know what it means to overcome? It means you stay the course until the end. You don't get to overcome until you reach the end. Because if you quit anywhere along the way, you haven't overcome. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. Oh, John talks so much about the color white in Revelation. All through Revelation. And I'm going to share more of that with you. And I will not blot out his name. Out of the book of life. Do you know why this holy Bible right here says. I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. Because he can blot out your name out of the book of life. So many people don't believe that. So many people have lived their lives. Believing a false doctrine. Given to them by a false prophet. Let me read this again. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. Do you know why the Bible says, I will not blot out his name out of the book of life? Because your name can be blotted out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father. What a thought. And before his angels. Do you think his angels are important to his father? He has sent angels to these churches to say these things. These are the angels that have come from on high that are saying these things to these churches. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Do you know how you have an ear to hear? You come to Jesus with a pure heart. You don't follow formalities. You don't do what everybody says you need to do. You get your Bible out and you study the word of God and you listen when the Holy Spirit speaks and you do what the Holy Spirit says do and you're not afraid and you don't back down and it doesn't matter who you feel is going to be hurt at you. You speak the truth anyway. Because the bottom line is, if you don't speak the truth to that person that you think might be hurt at you, that person may not make it to live with Jesus through eternity. They need you to speak the truth. When you do that, you have an ear to hear. When you follow Jesus with all of your heart, and you ask him for guidance, and you ask him for leadership, he says, if you seek me, I'll let you find me. You're the one that has the ear to hear. I've said this before, but do you know people that says, I've read the Bible through every year for the last 12 years. But their fruits of their life do not indicate that they know what the Bible says. They don't have an ear to hear. The, the Bible is an empty history book in their hands. Let's move on to Philadelphia. To the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David. We're going to talk about the key of David later. He that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth 
and no man openeth. I'm going to warn you before we get to Matthew 24 that every, almost everything that you have ever been taught about the church doctrine of rapture is backwards. Almost all of it is backwards. This right here that says that he openeth and no man shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth. When Noah and his family entered the ark, he didn't shut the door. God shut the door. God shut the door and no man could open it. That door was shut. Just like this right here says, and he shutteth and no man openeth it. Noah and his family got in the ark. Do you know who our ark is? Our ark is Jesus. We get in the ark. And all of the scriptures that talk about being carried away, about being taken, those scriptures are about those being taken by the powers of darkness. Those being carried away by the powers of darkness in destruction on the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord, according to scripture, the day of the Lord is one of the most horrible, horrendous days that is coming up on the face of this earth. Kind of makes you feel like it's around the corner from us, doesn't it? Who knows? It could be. We don't know. No man knows. Verse 8. He's talking to the church at Philadelphia. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word and has not denied my name. I told you at the beginning of the call that I have such a sober sense of spirit today. Maybe it's because of what we're facing in our world. But these are the people that God is ministering to today. Do you know Jesus, but you're tired? Do you know Jesus, but you, you, your family won't listen to you? Your, your friends think you're crazy? Not only because of your stance in the Lord, but, but because of your stance in the world? This is Jesus' message to you today. He says, I've opened a door. And no man can shut it. Don't worry, you're going to be okay. Don't worry, you're going to be okay. For thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word. He sees you, dear saint. He sees you that's kept his word. He loves you. It's not just things you've done to fill formalities. He sees you because you've kept his word. He, he knows those that have kept his word. And you have not denied his name. Do you know how you deny his name? You deny his name by your actions. I hope you're still there. <laughs> um, the internet went out for just a moment. I'm still in verse 8. He says, I know you have a little strength, but you've kept my word. And you've not denied my name. Then in verse 9, it says, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan. Oh, we're going to talk about the synagogue of Satan. These are people who have chosen to persecute you, to test you, to try you, just like they did Jesus. You do know it was the church that crucified Jesus. I will make of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, here's the beautiful part of this verse. I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. Do you know what Jesus is saying to John here to give to this church? I know who you are. I know that you've walked with me, and I know you love me, 
and I know that you have not failed me, and I know you're being persecuted. I know that this group of folks here called the, the synagogue of Satan is tormenting you. They're giving you trouble. They're ridiculing you. They're making fun of you, but I want you to know something because you have remained faithful because you have stayed at my feet because you have loved me. I'm going to make them come and worship before thy feet. And I, because, and, and I will let them know that I have loved you. That's the Jesus that we serve. That's what's coming y'all. If we just endure to the end, if we just stay faithful, if we just overcome, that's what you're going to get. That's what you're going to get. Verse 10, because thou hast kept the word of my patience. Do you have any idea how many people write me and say, I've had it. I'm giving, I'm, I'm moving on with life. I'm tired. I, this is crazy. I'm giving up. Do you know how many people have said that over the years about walking with Jesus? I can't do this anymore. Well, it goes out. See, this is why I think probably next week it might be a good idea if we don't have a, have a uh, teaching next week. Um, okay, it went out. It's back on. So uh, we'll keep going. We'll do this till we finish. Um, because thou, thou hast kept the word of my patience. Because you've been patient, you've endured, you're overcoming. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation. He's going to keep you from the hour of temptation. Now, his people are still here on earth. They haven't gone anywhere. And they're not going to go anywhere for a long time to come. He says he's going to keep us from the hour of temptation. These are his elect, y'all. These are his elect that he's going to keep from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world. It's going to get bad. But his elect are going to be right here, and he's going to keep them from this hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. It's going to try you. It's going to test you. It's going to test your heart. But he's right beside you, and he's going to keep you during that time. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man, are you ready for this? Oh, that no man take thy crown. Do you know why the Bible says, hold fast what you have, that no man take thy crown? It says it because your crown can be taken. It says it because your crown can be taken. If you don't endure to the end, you won't live with him through eternity. No matter what all you've done. No matter how many formalities you've gone through. You won't do it. Because he says your crown will be taken if you don't endure to the end. Him that overcometh. Him that overcometh. We're in verse 12. Him that overcometh. Will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. Of my God. We're going to talk more about this pillar in a few minutes. And he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God. The name of the city of my God. Which is the new Jerusalem. Which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. The name of Jesus will be written upon us. No different than Satan's name is going to be written on all those who walk with him. We're going to have the name of Jesus written upon us. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. You have an ear? If you don't have an ear to hear this, if you're not able to hear it and truly analyze it, it's because you're, you might need to check up on your heart and see if you're following him with a whole heart. Whole heart. I've said this a million times before, and I'll say it probably every time I do a teaching. You have to put everything you think you know about the Bible and religion in that box and put it on the top shelf of your closet of life. Tape it up real good. 
Because what you're going to learn as I'm teaching you this word, what you're going to hear, what you're going to see, and what you're going to learn does not coincide with the multitude of false doctrines that we've been taught for the last 100, 200, 300 years in the church. The children of Israel had been in bondage for 400 years. Remember, I talked about this last time. And when they found the book of the law, they fell on their faces. They said, it's no wonder that we're in the trouble we're in. We've strayed so far away from the book of the law. So have we, folks. So have we. We've lived hundreds of years in false doctrine. And you know why? Because it was passed down from generation to generation to generation. And, and, and these, these prominent preachers would just pick up on it. Especially after this, I told you this, after this Go Feel Bible came out. It was like that was all she wrote. It was like, oh my goodness. They latched onto that. As the old saying goes, like, white on rice. And it was all downhill from there. Because the Schofield Bible is a lie. It's not the truth. Let's go on. Verse 12. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God. The name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem. Which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. That's Jesus. And he that hath an ear, let him hear it, what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now we get to the church, to the angel of the church of Laodicea. Write these things, saith the Amen, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Whew. I know thy works. This one's going to hit you square between the eyes, folks. Okay, I tell you what I'm going to try to do. Um, I don't know if this will work or not, but I'm going to try to do it. I'm going to try to hook up. I'm, I'm using my cell phone internet, and it keeps going out. So let me try to hook up to... Okay, let's see if that makes a difference. Um, I hooked up to my house Wi-Fi. I live out in the country, and sometimes it's not as good as my phone Wi-Fi, but we'll see if this makes a difference. If it does, if it's worse, I'll go back to my cell Wi-Fi. Um, okay. I'm in verse 15. He says, I know thy works, that thou art neither hot, cold, nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot. Let me read that again. Because I'm going to say to you that this is where the great majority of those who say that they are Christians today are walking. And let me tell you why. I, walk, I know thy works. That thou art neither hot, cold, nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot. The angel is saying here to this church. I know that you're just lukewarm. I know that you are trying to appease everybody. I know that you're trying to sit on that fence as long as you can. I know that you're trying to not hurt anybody's feelings. I know that you're trying not to offend anybody. I know that you want everybody to come to your church. So, preacher, I, kn I know that you're not preaching the deep, powerful, cutting word of God. The what we used to call in the South, the hellfire and brimstone preaching. Because that kind of preaching says the anger of God and it says the blessing of God. And what's happened is our churches have left off of the righteous anger of God. You, you go back. Let me challenge you to do something today. You go look this up. In fact, I think it's free online. I think you can access it free online. It's called, it's a sermon that was preached. Oh my goodness. I've, uh, 200 years ago, 150, I'm not sure. Long time ago. And it was preached by Jonathan Edwards. And the name of the sermon is Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. You go read that. You go read that sermon and tell me how that sermon is different today than the sermons that we hear from our pulpits in our churches today. 
it's as different as, as daylight and dark. There is no preaching of denying sin today. There's preaching of love and tolerance and patience, not to offend anybody, not to shake, not to rock the boat, not to get on anybody's bad side. And guess what's happening with that kind of preaching today? People are dying and going to hell. That's what's happening with that kind of preaching today. We have to have it back. This this message right here, y'all, this message right here, I pray there's some preachers listening to me today. This message right here came from God Almighty, given to Jesus. Jesus has given it to the angel, to the spirit, excuse me. Jesus has given it to the spirit. The spirit is giving it to John and telling the angel of each church, this is what God Almighty is saying about your church. Pastor, do you hear this today? This is to us today. This is to us today. This is what God Almighty is saying about our churches today. I know that you're neither hot or cold. You just kind of biding time. You just rocking along. You just sitting on the fence. You're building an earthly kingdom. Verse 16. So here's what's going to happen. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Do you think if he spews you out of his mouth, you're going to live eternal, in eternity with him? You know you're not. If he spews you out of his mouth, you're gone. You're not going to live with him. He says he's going to do that if you're not hot, if you're lukewarm, if you're riding on the fence, if you're just doing stuff to create activities, if you're not standing up in the pulpit and saying, y'all, I'm sorry. I have failed you as a church. I haven't preached to you the whole word of God. I've preached the tolerant, kind, lukewarm stuff from God. But God has convicted my heart. And I'm going to preach the truth to you from now on. I'm going to tell you the word of God says to you. You're lukewarm. And if you're not hot or cold, he's going to spew you out of his mouth. I don't care what our church doctrine says that says once you, once you pray the prayer and sign the card that, that you can never be lost again, which is a lie. I don't care because this right here says that you can be lost again. This right here says that he'll spew you out of his mouth. You got to be in his mouth before he can spew you out of his mouth. That means you got to have once come to him before he can spew you out of his mouth. Because those people that have never come to him, they're not in his mouth. They're not a part of him. Realize what the word of God is saying. Verse 17, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor, and blind, and naked. Do you know how many churches, well, I, I keep talking about the church, y'all, but this is who these messages are to. They're to the churches. These churches, all seven of these churches represent us today. These messages are to these churches in these physical places to no greater detail than they are to us today in our physical churches in this place and where we live in this world today. Same message. Can you just tell, don't know, I don't even want you to tell me. Can you just imagine how many of these televangelists that think that they are rich that they are increased with goods, and that they have need of nothing. I can start naming them off. I can start naming them off. That feel that way, they can't be touched. 
They are at a place. And I'm going to tell you, most of them truly believe that they, have, that they have become little gods. You know, that's that was the lie in the Garden of Eden that caused Eve to lose what she had. Satan came to her and said, Ah, has, has God really said this to you? Is it really true that if you eat of this tree that... Um, that you're going to be cast out of the garden. You know what's really going to happen. If you eat of this tree, he knows that you're going to become just like him. He don't want you to become just like him. In other words, you'll become a God. You'll become a little God. You just go ahead and eat. Do you know? I've studied the foundational principles. My husband and I, he's the one that brought him to my realization we studied the foundational principles of many of these televangelists. And it's written in their theology that, that there comes a time that you will become as a little God, which is the lie of Satan. You will never become as a little God. The only power you have is the power you have through Jesus Christ. He and God the Father are God. We are not little gods. We are children of God who has access to the power of God and the power of the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ. And that's the only way. Jesus Christ is the only way by where we can be saved. And he is the only way by where we can have power. Verse 18. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in fire. Do you know how you buy gold tried in fire? Oh, look how significant this is today in our physical world in what is happening to gold and silver on the markets today. People are cashing in their fiat dollars and buying gold and silver because gold and silver are God's money. Gold and silver were created within the earth and it's the only true money gold and silver is the only true money so he makes this correlation here i counsel thee i'm telling you church church at laodicea i'm telling you church of america buy of me gold tried in fire you know how you buy gold tried in fire you pay the price to buy the real thing, and you're going to have to go through a fire to purchase it. It's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you greatly. Let me ask you something. Do you think when the three Hebrew children were thrown in the fiery furnace, because they wouldn't bow down and worship the idol, do you think that cost them anything? Do you think that was a fiery trial? Do you think that, that when they were thrown in the fiery furnace, they had to give up all of everything in this life? Because what they said to that king in that day was, O king, we know that our God can do this. But then they said, but even if he doesn't, we'll not bow down and worship your idol. We know God can do it, but even if he doesn't, we'll not bow down and worship your idol. That's the cost. It's going to cost you to walk with Jesus because you're going to have to lay down this earthly life. You're going to have to die to your flesh in order for the spirit to live in you. And you're going to have to come to the same place the three Hebrew children did when they said, Oh God, I know you can do this, but even if you don't save me from this situation, I will not bow to this fleshly idol any longer. Come out of those churches that don't preach Jesus. Come out of them, y'all. They are a form of godliness, but they have no power. Come out of them. Pay the price to buy gold, pure heavenly gold, tried with fire. Pay that price 
Die to your flesh so that your spirit might live. He says in this verse, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried with fire that thou mayest <laughs> be rich. That thou mayest be rich. He says in the verse before that, these people that are walking by the flesh, that don't know him, that are using religion to deceive people. They're wolves in sheep's clothing. He says, they say inside them, no different from what, what, from what the, the woman of Babylon says on over. Y'all, we've got some times coming for us in Revelation. Oh my goodness, as we get on over in Revelation, you are going to be blown away by what the Word says about your walk with Him. It's powerful. He says, these people who are not walking with God, but who say they're walking with God, these false prophets, these people who are building earthly kingdoms and using religion to do that, they're saying, hey, I'm rich. I'm increased with goods. I have need of nothing. And they don't know that they are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. But then what he's saying is that those of you and me that come to him, like the three Hebrew children stood strong, and they come to him and they buy that gold tried with fire, they pay the price. They die to their flesh. We come to him. You know what he says? He says, you do that and you'll be rich with the true riches. Because all the others just going to melt away. I'm going to make you a comparison. You patriots who follow me, you know that the money that we have in our hands today is fiat money. It's worthless. It's not backed by gold. It's worthless. It's fake money. It's fake money. That's what is happening in this verse, these two verses here. These people that are saying, I am good, I have need of nothing, they are preaching a fake gospel that is going to crumble, just like this fiat money that we have in our possession today. It's going to go away. We are going to get a new currency. But that new currency is going to be backed by gold and silver. And it's coming. It, we, we are on the heels of it. It's coming. Things are coming fast. And it's going to happen. That, this money, this money, this money that we're going to get is money that's true. It's money that's been tried by fire. Because you know what? When you find gold, what do you have to do to gold to get the impurities out of it? You have to fire it up and all the impurities. I won't go through all the process of purifying gold, but all the, all the impurities come to the top and they scoop them off. It's pure gold. We have to have all of our impurities brought to the top, brought to the surface by the fire so that the impurities can be scooped off. And we become pure gold. That's how we become rich with the true riches. And that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed. White, here again, raiment. That, that means purity. White means purity. And we're going to talk more about that in a few minutes. That thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. He just got through telling these people that think they're clothed, that think they're rich, that think they're in in increased with goods. He just got through telling them that they're telling them that they're naked because they have no clothing. They have no righteous clothing. They're naked. Anybody who does not walk with Jesus is naked. They have no clothing. They have no purity. But when you come to Jesus with a whole heart, this is what he's going to do for you. He's going to give you white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness does not appear. It's clothed. That's the Jesus that loves us. 
and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. Oh, my goodness. Guess what that means? That means, y'all remember the scripture that says, I see through a glass darkly, but there's going to come a time that I can see better, so to speak. I can't quote it. You see a measure today. We read the book and we see some today. We see a measure today. But what happens is when you come to him with your whole heart, like he's trying to tell this church of Laodicea here, when you come to him with a whole heart, he says, when you do that and I give you, when you, when you buy gold of me that's been tried by fire, when you put your flesh down so your spirit can live, then I'm going to give you white raiment. I'm going to give you, uh, I'm going to give you the true riches and I'm going to put eye salve on your eyes so that you might see. Have you ever known people that when they speak the word or when they teach the word, you are mesmerized and you think, how do they know all that? How do they hear that? That's because they have come to Jesus by being tried with fire and become pure gold and that Jesus has anointed their eyes with eyesalve that they might see. That's a greater degree of vision than what you get when you just first come to him. A far greater degree. It's a process, y'all. I've been telling you for three weeks now. It's the journey. It's the journey to overcome. It's not, it's not pray the prayer and get forgiveness of your sins alone. You have to do that. That's how we become born again. You get your sins forget, forgiven. But then you start your journey. That's Your journey is where you buy of him gold tried with fire. You don't get that up front, and you're not saved until the end, after you've overcome. And if you're, if you're buying gold of him every day, tried by fire, and if you're walking with him, and you're repenting every day, and you're coming to Jesus, and you're seeking him, and you're asking him what's wrong with your journey, and every time that you see something, you're, you're coming to the light. Every time you step out of a, a piece of darkness and you see the light, you come to the light. Jesus will keep you and nothing can happen to you until Christ is formed in you and you have overcome. He will never let anyone die that is coming to him, that is purifying their heart until they reach a point that they've overcome. And none of us know when that is. You don't know. I don't know. We can't clock it. We can't measure it. We can't chart it. But it's all about the journey. It's all about the journey. Now look at this next verse. <gasps> as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. How long has it been since you have felt the rebuke of the Lord? How long has it been since he has chastened you for something you said or did? How long has it been since you've heard that voice inside you say, Ah, you really don't need to go there again. That's not a good place to be. And you repented and you never went back. How long has it been since you heard that voice inside you say, oh, you shouldn't have said that to that person. That was rude and ugly. And you repented and apologized to that person if you needed to. And you never said anything like that again. That's the rebuke and chasing of the Lord. And he will do it every day of your life. And you know why he does it every day of your life? Because that's how you overcome. That's how you kill the giants that are on the land of your heart. When you come to him and you get forgiveness of your sins, you repent. You become born again and the Holy Spirit comes in and starts leading and guiding you. And you move into this thing that we call sanctification. You know, the church, when I was growing up, I was raised Pentecostal. 
And there was a favorite phrase that we talked about in the church. It was called save, sanctified, and fill with the Holy Ghost. The churches today have left off sanctification. That's the journey. The church, the church, that's the journey is the sanctification. Our four, 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 forefathers had it right. You have to go through the sanctification. You got to go through the rebuke. You got to go through the chastisement. And you know why? Here's why. The Bible says that Jesus learned obedience through the things that he suffered. Jesus. If Jesus learned obedience through the things that he suffered, don't you think we will too? What kind of arrogant individual would think, I prayed that prayer. I'm good to go. I don't have to be chastised. I don't have to be rebuked. I don't have to be sanctified. It's done. They're the ones that we're about to read about in Matthew 24. It's going to be a sad day, y'all. It's going to be a sad day. Verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. When he sups with you, that means he he eats of the Spirit together with you. You consume the Holy Spirit. You consume the things of God. You take them in. You drink them in. You consume the things of the Spirit. You make them a part of you to always lead and guide you. He's knocking at the door. Did you say that prayer one time, but you haven't been going on your journey like you're supposed to? He's knocking. He's knocking. He's saying, come on, let me in. If you'll let me in, we'll travel together. And I'll help you. And I'll take care of you. And we'll eat together. And we'll talk together. We'll converse together. Verse 21. To him that overcometh. How many times do we have to read it? To him that overcometh. Will I grant to sit with me in my throne. We're going to talk about this some more today. Even as I also overcame. What a foolish prideful, arrogant bunch of church-going folks we have been. Oh, my goodness. It stirs up my righteous anger to think that we have named a place in God's kingdom that is so arrogant that we could come to him and we could ask forgiveness of our sins and then presume upon God Almighty to say, that's all I've got to do. That is a presumption that is hell-bound. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame. It's a slap in the face of Jesus to say that he had to overcome. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. All right, you ready? We're fixing to go on a wild ride here. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew 24. Matthew 24 is a direct correlation with Revelation. And um, what I'm about to share is going to be difficult for some of you. I, I've, you know, I've talked about, I've talked a lot about eternal security and what I just got through reading just completely annihilates eternal security and once saved, always saved. It, that is just a, that is a huge false doctrine. And, and the chapter that I just read completely does away with that. It's not even scriptural. It's not even, even partially scriptural. And now, I'm going to uh, talk about the church theory of rapture. And that's what Matthew 24 talks about. It talks about eternal security as well, but it talks a lot about the church theory of rapture. And before I read it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remind you of something. 
our church fathers never preached the rapture of the church until a, a man came along who was a tyrant. He was um, kind of how I see some of the televangelists today. He was uh, arrogant. He was a politician. And his name was Cyrus Schofield. And he decided that he was going to write his own Bible. Do you know how many people have written their own Bible? That's why I may look at other versions, but I always bring it back to the King James. So he decided he decided that he knew what the, um, the, the he knew about the rapture of the church and how it was going to all come down. So he wrote a Bible and put that in it. And the church picked it up and ran with it like wildfire. All denominations. Pentecostal, Baptist, uh, it, they, they've all run with it. And, and he took verses. Oh, God, I can't even imagine the wrath of God that's going to be on people who take verses completely out of context to make them, make them say what they want them to say. And we're fixing to see it in clear black and white and red because some of these words are in red. Okay. Chapter 24 of Matthew. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left one stone upon another, and that, that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat up on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us. When shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming? He is coming. The Bible says that he's coming in the clouds, and that is most certainly going to happen. And the end of the A, and the end of the world. Verse 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them, He starts off, he starts off by saying, Be careful that you don't let anybody deceive you. Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. You know why he told them, Be careful and don't let anybody deceive you? Because you can be deceived. That's why he said that. We can be deceived. We can be deceived. If we take the traditions of men that have been passed down to us by generations of people, generations of preachers that we knew, knew God. If we take their teachings, I don't care what they are, and we don't study the word of God to show ourselves approved, we can be deceived. That's just the way it goes. It's that way. Do you think that the, the Jews in the Sanhedrin court that crucified Jesus, do you think that they made the word of God that they had say what they wanted it to say to complete what they wanted to accomplish? You know they did. I had a dear, precious friend say to me yesterday, Rita, surely... Some of these old men of old, surely some of these pastors that just seem like they are so on fire for God, surely some of these men know the truth. And I, they may. I just don't know many. Because they've accepted traditions of men and false doctrines that have been embedded in their particular denomination for hundreds of years. And they haven't questioned it. They haven't talked back. They haven't bought that gold tried by fire. It's easier not to rock the boat. Verse 4. Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. And shall deceive many. Now, this can be taken a number of different ways, and I'm not even going to go into it today because it, it, it has so many great meanings. 
And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, say that you be not troubled. Are we hearing of wars and rumors of wars today? Don't be troubled. Just trust in him. He's going to take care of us. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Okay, the end is not yet. He's fixing to tell us about the end. Okay, you got that. He's fixing to tell us about the end. For nation shall rise against nation. Kingdom shall rise against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in different places, diverse places. And all these are the beginnings of sorrows. Now, he's talking to us about the end coming. And here he's talking about the beginnings of sorrows. Okay? Then they shall deliver you. The church hadn't gone anywhere now yet, right? That we're still here. The elect is still here. Then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended. Are we living in a world today where everybody is offended by something? Yes, we are. We, I, I, I'm amazed sometimes at what an angry world we live in. What an angry world we live in. Many will be offended and shall betray one another. We're living in a world now where they are trying to get you to betray your neighbor. Have y'all seen the signs on Facebook that says, um, one just, I just saw one the other day, says there are people who are prepping with, with too much enthusiasm. Do you have somebody that is uh, upsetting you by all of their prepping talk? And you can turn them in. You can report them because they're causing you stress, because you're offended by what they're doing. Oh, there's all kinds. If you haven't seen them, I'm telling you, I've seen several on, on different subjects where you can report people that bother you about something that they've posted. They shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Verse 11, and many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. I wish that we could put every pastor and preacher and televangelist that we know in a slot and let Jesus say, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, 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 yes, no, yes, no. Just so that we could go to, the, to all the yeses and say, oh, I want to walk with you. I want to come to your church. I want to hear what you've got to say every Sunday. I need truth. I need reality, but we don't have that. So we have to be led by the Spirit because they're out there. Y'all, they're out there. True preachers and pastors and true followers that have been, that have bought that gold tried by fire, they're out there. You just have to pray that God will bring them across your path, will lead you to them so that you can know because he says here that, um, uh, Many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. You know why he said shall deceive many? Because we can be deceived. We can think, oh, not my pastor. Not my pastor. You start asking him some questions that offends his structure, and you'll find out real quick whether he's true. You ask him any question that offends his structure, and, and, if it's, and if it's not in keeping with his structure, you'll find out real quick if he's true or not. Verse 12, and because iniquity shall abound, has iniquity abounded? We, we are, we've killed going on 70 million babies. We have a, we have a ginormous group of people who are killing children just to get their adrenalized blood. We have a group of people that are huge 
that are killing people after they traffic them? Would you say iniquity, iniquity abounds? And the love of many shall wax cold. This is a strong little section right here. The love of many shall wax cold. For it to be the love of many, that means that it had to be a love at one time. For it to be a love of many, that means that there had to have been a time that they loved Jesus with all their heart. Do you remember the church that we read about last time where it says, no, it was the first time, it was in the first chapter, um, or it might have been the beginning of the second chapter where he says, he says, I know this and this and this about you, but you've lost your first love. That's these people right here. You've lost your first love. You did love him at one time. You did have a passion for him at one time. You were excited to get up in the morning. You were excited to read the word to see what he was going to say to you today. You had a love for Jesus. But it says in these last days that the love of many would wax cold. Now, y'all, the church has not been taken out. This is Jesus talking to his disciples, and he's giving you a step-by-step -step lineup of what's coming for the end of the age. We're still here. We're still on earth. But the love of many is going to wax cold. That's why I shared with you about the book that I have taken some really good information from that Milton Green wrote. It's called The Great Falling Away Today because that's what's happened. We have churches that are still having church, but there is no power of God in their churches. It's just all formalities. It's just all rhythms. It's just all programs. Verse 13. Have we heard this verse before? Does this sound familiar? Verse 13. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. So Matthew says you got to endure to the end too in order to be saved. He's not the only one. Revelation and Matthew are not the only two places it says this. It says it in the Old Testament as well. And this, verse 14, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Then shall the end come. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel. Daniel is the brother book to Revelation. So much coincides with Daniel. When you see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel, the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. That's a whole subject all its own. But he's just building these folks up to say, the end is not yet. We're still here. The end is not yet. Let then, verse 16, then let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. The church hadn't gone anywhere. We're still here. But he's saying there's going to come a time so bad. The abomination of desolation is going to be standing in the holy place. Let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains. You know, if you were raised with the plan of the ages like I was, you think the church has already been taken out when this takes place. They're going to flee to the mountains. They're going to cry for the rocks to, to fall on them. The church is still here. The church hadn't gone anywhere. Let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him which is on the mount housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. You better get prepared because you're fixing to walk through some tough times. That's what Matthew is saying here in the word of God and the church hadn't gone anywhere. Matthew's saying, get ready. What I've been saying, get ready. What Heather and I have been saying, you better get ready. Because the end is not yet. We're going to walk through some tough times. And it's not going to be easy. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child. 
Ooh, that sunlight's come through bright, hasn't it? And to them that give suck in those days. But pray that your flight be not in winter and neither on the Sabbath day. For then, are you listening? The church is still here. Matthew hadn't said a word about us leaving. This is Jesus talking. These are red words, y'all, from when we started in verse 4. This is Jesus' words. He has not said up until this point. He has not said. And then the church is going to be taken out. And then you better flee to the mountains, the ones of you that are left. And you better pray that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. He didn't say that. He's talking to the church. He's talking to the elect. For then, verse 21, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be. Is this great tribulation that the church has, is thinking that they're going to get caught up out of and not have to go through? You know it is. This is way, the way I was taught. There shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be. That is the great tribulation. This is Jesus speaking. The words are all read. He's talking to his people in the flesh. He's talking to the disciples, and he's talking to his people in the spirit. He's talking to the church. There's coming a great tribulation. Verse 22. This, this right here is going to seal it for you. This verse 22 is going to seal it for you that that's who he's talking to. How much plainer can it be? We've been lied to, y'all. We've been lied to. The church has been lied to. The precious children of God have been lied to. And it makes me fiery angry to think about it. Listen to verse 22. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. Except those days be shortened, we would all die. It's going to be rough. But for whose sake? But for the elect's sake. And I'm just looking at the clock, and I'm just telling y'all, I want to finish this today, so I may go past 3 o'clock today. So if you need to watch the rest of it later, that's perfectly fine with me. I have, I've got to get this done today, and we're going to start with chapter 4 come next time. Verse 22, and except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, the elect are those that love him with a pure heart. The elect are the ones we just read about that have bought gold tried by fire. Those are the elect. That's us that love him with all of our hearts. We're walking through this great tribulation. And in the next verse, he says, and if I don't shorten the days, the, nobody would live. But for the elect's sake, he's going to shorten the days just for our sakes. Because he loves us more than anything. Because we're the ones who have laid our lives down. Because we're the ones who have bought that gold tried by fire. Because we're the ones that have chosen spirit over flesh. And we've given up our flesh that we might live in the spirit. We are the elect. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. We're still here, y'all. We haven't gone anywhere. We are the elect. And we are going through this great tribulation in verse 21 that has never been from the beginning of the world nor shall ever be again. Verse 23. Then if any man say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. Did y'all see the, the holograms where they've got Jesus standing up in the clouds, and it's a hologram? 
They're going to do some wild and crazy things in these last days, y'all. And we've got to be prepared. We've got to be prayed up. Because if you're not following him with a whole heart, remember what I just read to you in Revelation? He's going to put eye salve on your eyes and give you the ability to see. If you don't have, if you don't have that white garment on and if you don't have the eye salve on your, eye, salve on your eyes so that you have the ability to see through the Spirit, you could be deceived. You know why he says right here uh, in the very beginning, verse 4, that I just read to you, take heed that no man deceive you? Because you can be deceived. And the more you come to him and put your flesh to death, the clearer you see. For there shall arise, verse 24, for there shall arise false prophets and false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders. Wouldn't you think that a hologram of Jesus standing in the clouds in the heavens is a, is a great sign and wonder? It is. Insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. They can't deceive the very elect if the very elect are gone. They're not gone. They're right here. Walking through this great tribulation. They're right here. If it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. But we're not going to be deceived if we stay at the feet of Jesus every day. Because we're going to have had that ice have put on our eyes. And we're going to see through the powers of darkness. We're going to be sanctified. And we're going to be able to have eyes to see. All of Revelation says, if he who has eyes to eat, see, and ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. Verse 25, Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. Y'all need to come over here to our church. We got Jesus over here. Oh, y'all need to come over here to this, uh, to this uh, worship center. We got the spirit over here. Oh, y'all need to come over here to this singing. We got Jesus over here. Don't be chasing spirits. You know how people, when, when these televangelists um, used to have these um, healing services, you know how these people would, would, would go from one healing service to the next and try to get, trying to get healed? And they never got healed. And the ones that were healed were fake. God is a healing God and he can heal anything. But he's not going to work through a false prophet. Let me challenge you. I don't recommend movies often. But there is a movie that Steve Martin did many, many years ago. Um, what is that movie called? Um... I'll put it in the comments after I get through. It was a movie that he did, and it was about a false prophet who had a healing ministry. And I was really surprised because at the end of the movie, I thought they were going to end it like making fun of, of, of preachers and, and, and prophets that do lay hands on people and they do get healed. I thought they were going to make fun. They didn't. In this movie by Steve Martin... Um, when they ended it, the last thing they said is, you've got to watch out for the real thing. I was so pleased that they said that because the real thing, the real man of God can lay hands on you and you'll be healed if you have faith to believe. There are true pastors and teachers and prophets. Yes, thank you so much, Jennifer Warren. It's called Leap of Faith. That's the name of the movie, Leap of Faith. What an awesome movie it is. And it shows you the backstage of um, false healing ministries. And it's powerful. It's very powerful. Okay. Um, we're still in Matthew 24. Let's go to um, verse 27. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. It's just, it's going to be wonderful. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from the heaven, 
and the powers of the heavens shall be, shall be shaken. You and I may see this. You, may see, you and I may see this. If we live long enough, we may see this. And then, oh God in heaven, how can somebody read this and believe the traditional doctrine of rapture that is taught in churches? It absolutely amazes me. And the reason they do is because it's what they, their forefathers taught them. But if they get in the Word and read it, they'll see different if they really believe the Word of God. Verse 30. After this great tribulation, after the, all of these horrible things, after the sun, the, the moon is darkened, uh, after Jesus shortens the days or else the very elect who are still here would be, would be uh, killed. He's got to shorten the days because it's going to be rough. And then, after, then shall appear. Let me just read this, the last part. Um, Give her light, and the stars fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be, shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Here he is coming in the clouds, y'all. He's coming in the clouds. But he's not coming back over here before we go through all this stuff. That's a lie. And right here the word says it's a lie. We will look up after we see all these things happening. And the Son of Man, we shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect. How in the world would he gather together his elect if they were gone in rapture? Because it says he's going to gather together his elect from the four winds and from one end of heaven to the other. They wouldn't be there. They'd be gone. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Have you ever wondered what it means by this generation shall not pass? I, I'm, I'm going to share this partly out of great awe and partly out of great fear. I believe that this generation that he's talking about is the generation that's going to see all of these things as they begin to happen in the beginning of Matthew 24. That when these things begin to happen in Matthew 24, that generation is not going to pass until all these things be fulfilled, which generation is 40 years. What if we are that generation? What if we are that generation where all these, because does this not fit our world today? Does not everything I've just read to you in Matthew fit our world today? What if we are that generation that shall not pass before all these things be fulfilled? <sighs> What a feeling of awe and absolute. If I were walking in the flesh, it would be fright to think that. Wow. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Verse 36. Now it's fixing to get real. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels, but my Father only. They're still red. These words are still in red. This is Jesus speaking. He's still speaking. He's the one that's been the whole time. That day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels in heaven, but my Father only. Jesus doesn't know when he's coming back. Only God the Father. God's going to turn to his son one day and say, Go get your children. They've been through enough. It's time. And Jesus, uh, Jesus is going to, in verse 30, 
He's going to step out on those clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he's going to sound a great trumpet. And he's going to gather us all wherever we are. We're out on the earth, in the graves, uh, gone on long ago. Wherever we are, he's going to gather us from the four corners of the, of the existence to be with him forever. But here's the clincher. Verse 37. But as the days of Noah were. Now, he's, this is Jesus talking. These words are in red. He prefaces everything that he's about to say. Everything. With a comparison of the days of Noah. You have to keep that in mind to have eyes to see and ears to hear what he's about to say. This is all in red. This is all Jesus. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. He's saying to you that the coming of the Son of Man is going to be just like the days of Noah. For in as the days were for as in the days that were before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah Noah entered the ark. Okay, now if this is going to be exactly like the days of Noah, we could say, okay, we just read about Noah. They were eating and drinking, giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. So let's say in our current world today, in our world today, they are eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that God's people entered into Jesus. See, the ark was Noah's safety. Jesus is our safety. Noah entered into that place of Complete safety with God. See, Noah didn't have Jesus. The ark was, was Noah's Jesus. He obeyed. He built the ark. He sacrificed. He bought that gold tried by fire. And he entered the ark. And when he entered the ark, God shut the door. So here's Noah. He's still on the earth. But he's in an ark. He's in a place of safety. He's protected. He is, uh, he's in a place that the powers of darkness can't touch him. That's exactly how we are today when we enter into Jesus. We're protected. We're in a place of safety. I just got through reading to you that he's going to, in Revelation, that he's going to be right there with you, that nothing can harm you. He's going to be walking right beside you all along the way. No matter what happens to the rest of the world and on the outside, Jesus is your safety. Jesus is your ark. So as we enter our ark, who is Jesus, something is about to happen. And knew not till the flood came. That, okay, well, let me be sure you understand this. He's talking about the people that have not entered into Jesus. He's talking of people that did not enter Noah's ark. For inasmuch the days that were before the flood that they were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the, into the ark. And they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Oh my goodness. They knew not until the flood came. What is the flood? The flood is the powers of darkness that destroys everybody. The flood in Noah's day was the, was the uh, tool that God used to destroy every living thing on this earth. The flood came and destroyed them. In our day, the flood that's coming is the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is the most horrible, horrible, I don't know another word more than horrible, 
day that's coming that is going to destroy those that do not walk with Jesus while we are safe in the ark. And this is going to happen after this tribulation that we just read about. Because we're still here on this earth. This is Jesus. It's still in red. Jesus is saying, look at um, verse 40. I mean, yeah, verse 40 again. No, excuse me. Uh, verse 39. He says, they knew not until the flood came. That was then in Noah's day. These folks in our day, they're not going to know until the flood of the powers of darkness come and take them all away. The flood in Noah's day is indicative of the flood of the powers of darkness today that's going to destroy everybody that doesn't walk with Jesus. Jesus is the ark. And when we get in the ark, we're saved. And we're taking, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. So shall the coming. They knew not until the flood came. And took, this is the verse right before Verse 40, they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. The flood is the powers of darkness that's going to kill everybody that doesn't walk with God because those who are with Jesus are in the ark, and Jesus is the ark. So shall, so shall the coming, remember that, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. The very next words that Jesus says out of his mouth is, then shall two be in the field, one shall be taken and the other left. So who's the one taken? The one taken is taken by the powers of darkness. And the one that's left is the one that's left in the ark, in Jesus. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. One shall be taken and the other left. The one that's taken, according to what Jesus said out of the words of his own mouth in verse 39, the one that's taken is the one that's taken by the, power, by the powers of darkness, just like the flood in Noah's day. That's the one taken. The one that's left is the one who is left on this earth in the ark, Jesus. We haven't gone anywhere, y'all. Jesus, from the beginning of the time in Matthew 24, that they said to him, the disciples said to him, tell us, what shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus starts talking in verse 4. We are on verse 4. 41, Jesus has been talking every verse since then, and not once did he say that his saints were going to be raptured out. Not once. They're still right here. But we are in the ark Jesus. We are in the ark Jesus, protected from the powers of darkness that's going to be a flood on this earth. Would you say, according to what you know, that there is an absolute flood of the powers of darkness on this earth right now? This earth has never known a time like this is right now. This earth has never known a time that every nation is at the same place. Every nation is recognizing what's going on. Some of the nations are trying to come through on the good side. Some of them are fighting tooth and nail. The, the earth has never been in a state that it's in right now. And y'all know this is true. You know this is true. We've never, we've never been here. It's, it's a new place. What if this is, this generation shall not pass until all these things be fulfilled that Jesus just told us about. But just know that the one that is taken is not taken in rapture. That's a false doctrine. The one that's taken but out of the very words of, of the mouth of Jesus, the verse above it, the one that's taken is the one that's taken in the flood and destroyed by the powers of darkness. Verse 42, watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would have come, oh, the thief! The thief, he would not have had his house broken into. All these folks that are walking around not, not walking with God, 
Would you say that the, the powers of darkness are the thief that's come to steal, kill, and destroy? And if they knew, if they knew when this was going to happen, they would, they would have not suffered their house to be broken into. But they don't know because they don't, they're not following Jesus. They're not in the ark. Noah went in the ark and God shut the door. When you enter the ark, y'all, this is part, and, and here, here again is another part of the eternal security doctrine. When you enter the ark, when you come into Jesus, you are sealed with a seal. And nobody can take you out of the hand of Jesus but you until you overcome to the very end. But you can remove yourself from Jesus' hands, but nobody else can. No powers, nothing. As long as you are at the feet of the Jesus every day and at the foot of the cross. Verse 44. Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. He's coming. This is, this is Jesus Christ talking here. Get in the ark. Because I'm coming back for my people. Get in the ark. I want to live eternity with you. Get in the ark. Don't be destroyed by the powers of darkness. Therefore be ye ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give him meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, here's the ark, when he cometh, find him so doing the right thing. It's just like the ten virgins. When the bridegroom came, five of the ten virgins were doing the right thing. They were buying that oil tried by fire. They were filling their lamps with oil. The five foolish virgins were definitely virgins. They had come to Jesus. They had lamps, but they had no oil. That meant they had fallen away. They had not prepared for his coming. Verse 48, but if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming. See, he's still talking about the powers of darkness here. He's still talking about those that don't know him. And shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him and an hour that he's not aware of and do what? Take him away by the flood. And shall cut him asunder and point him a portion with the hypocrites. And there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That is Matthew 24. All right. I got just a few more things to share. So let's go back to Revelation chapter 3. Okay. In the very first part that we studied a while ago, um, <clears throat> he says when he, when he uh, let's see, let's go to verse... Uh, Let's go to, I know thy works, very first verse of chapter 3. I know thy works that thou hast a name, but thou, that thou livest, but thou art dead. And I'm not going to read all of this again, but he's talking to the church at Sardis here. And he says to the church at Sardis, you got to repent. And if you don't wake up, then I'm going to come and you'll not know what hour that I come. He's talking to this church. He says, you have, um, you still have a few among you that walk with me, have not sold their garments, um, and I'm coming for them. They're going to be the ones that are in the ark, that they're in Jesus. They will walk with me in white is one of the things that Jesus says about them. And then this reference to the white garments, you also get a reference to the white garments later in 3, in verse 18. If you actually did a search of the book of Revelation, White shows up a lot. He talks about white, white stones, white garments. Um, he talks about white a lot. It's a prominent color in the book of Revelation. White, um, uh, in the New Testament, there are 26, in the New Testament, there are 26 occurrences to the term white. 16 of them are in the book of Revelation. So well over half. Eight of the 16 refer to clothing and the other eight of the 16 to some aspect of the heavenly realm in the book of Revelation. 
let's, I'm going to read, you don't have to go there, but I'm going to read to you Daniel 1135. Um, this is a correlation to that. And some of the wise shall stumble so that they may be refined, purified, out of trouble, such as has never been. This is in Daniel. You see how the Bible correlates itself? You see how, uh, you, you see how if you run reference and you don't just accept things that people tell you, I don't care. I said in the beginning of this, I don't care how many books your pastor's written. I don't care um, how many people go to hit your church. I don't care how many new people come in. I don't care what, I don't care what his status is. If he doesn't study the word of, with fresh eyes every week, then he is probably living out the traditions of men and not the word of God. We have to study the word of God. And you can be a, a just a simple country girl from Sand Mountain, Alabama. And Jesus can show you what his word says because when he died on that cross, the veil of that temple that covered the Holy of Holies that we could never enter into was cut in two, it was split in two, and the Holy of Holies was left wide open for us to walk right into the presence of God when we pray and when we read God's word and get divine, divine information from God. Personal, one-on-one, -on -one, it's ours if we pay the price, if we buy the gold tried by fire, if we die to our flesh and live to the spirit. At the time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble we just read about, such as has never been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. Everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. I'm also going to do a teaching, one of these Thursday teachings, just on the books, the names written in the book, and how you can have your name written in the book, and it can be blotted out of the book, and it can be written back in the book again. This is all scripture. And it can be blotted out again. When you write, when your name gets written in the book, it's not a one-time thing. So don't think that if you fall away that you can't come back to God. You can. So here we have a reference to this time, this time of trouble, time of, uh, it goes back to, to being made white. Um, John is drawing on these things from Daniel to confirm what he's trying to say to these churches in Revelation. Now let's go back to um, Daniel 12 and 10. Many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined, but the wicked shall act wickedly. So there's this connection with being made, being made white at some time of trouble. So what this is saying is, and Daniel, it's even correlating the time that we're made white with a time of trouble. You know what that means? That means that we're required to suffer. That means that because that time of trouble is a time of suffering. And like I told you a little bit ago, Jesus learned obedience through the things that he suffered and so will we. So this time of trouble gives us the ability to gain a garment of white because it purifies us. At times of trouble purifies us. So white denotes membership or belongingness for those who overcome at the end of days. And white, uh, of course, would be associated with the heavenly realm in the book of Revelation. We've got, uh, we've got a reference to this white clothing a number of times. Believers transformed into whiteness or white garments. If you compare Revelation 2, 26, 27 with him that overcomes, I will put him over the nations to him that overcomes in 321. He will sit on my throne. Remember, we just read it a while ago. I will give to him the morning star so that these are transformative things. Jesus is, when we come through this fire, when we come through this, this thing that's going to create purity in us. It's going to create our garments being white. Then he's going to give us the morning star. Um, there's something that happens to us as believers. 
He's connecting these things. He's taking the crowns. Um, he's he's uh, We're being made white. We've got white garments. We've got crowns. We're put over the nations. We're given the morning star. We're ruling with Jesus. We're sitting on his throne. All of those things I just read you in Revelation. All of those things show up in Revelation 2 and 3. Every time that I heard some past sermon about crowns in heavens, heaven, it's always like winning a prize. You know, when you think of a crown, you think, even like in pageants, you think you get the crown if you win the prize. But it's really about rulership. And this is another misconception of, um, of, of a lot of revelation is, and, and other parts of the Bible too, is that this crown that we receive it's not just about winning the prize. I'm not saying it can't be at all about winning the prize, but it's also huge about rulership. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a shared rule as a member of God's family body. We are sharing rule. We are joint heirs with Christ. That's what the word says. In other words, we're a member of God's council. Remember in the Old Testament where it says, don't you know that you're going to judge the angels? We're going to be in the, in the royal council. We're going to have ruling authority. Basically, you're transformed to look like what you are, a ruling member of the council of God. Members of God's host, members of God's council, angels are always being depicted in white. And here we have believers in white. We've got the language of the holy ones in the New Testament applied to believers. Now, now John is applying the language that's, that's applied usually to angels. Now he's applying it to believers. There are all sorts of pieces to this and we failed to put them together. But where they all lead to is the transformation of the human believer to membership in God's council. It's a membership role in God's council. We tend to look at all the little pieces of it in sermons and about making it like winning a contest or performance on the earth um, or, uh, or something like that. It's just so much bigger than that. You know, we, I shall wear a robe and a crown. We think, we think of all those things as being, as being um, just that, that we made it. We made it. So Y'all, so much like, so much of the Bible, we're just looking on the surface. We're just skimming the surface. We're not seeing the depth of what Christ wants us to believe and see. We're not looking deep. We're look, looking surface. We're sure going to wear a robe and crown. We're sure going to have a crown. But what does that crown mean? It doesn't just mean that we've made it. It doesn't just mean that we've won. It means that we're a part of God's ruling council. It means that we're going to share, we're going to share, uh, we're joint heirs with him. We're going to share rulership with him in the heavenlies. We're going to judge the angels according to the word of God. <sighs> we tend to look at the little pieces we hear of this in sermons, but it's so much bigger than that. It's not the whole picture. It's not even the most important part of the picture. He picks up, John picks up on a line, they will walk with me in white. We're going to walk with him in white. In, in Revelation 3, 3 and 4, it says, um, it says uh, that we're going to walk with God in white. Some sort of language is this, is this relationship with God and it's certainly, let's, let's think about Enoch and Noah for a minute. And the Bible says that they walked with God. And of course, Enoch, it says that Enoch was and then was not. He was translated. And the Bible says that he walked with God. Oh, does that not give you an awesome feeling to think that there might be some correlation with him and, and walking with God? He is taken into God's presence, into the council throne room. He's there. Enoch is there already on God's divine counsel, just waiting for us. And so is Noah. There's a little bit more going on than just the fact that we've won a crown and we've made it. We're not going to make it by the skin of our teeth, y'all. We're not. We're going to, it, when we enter in, it's going to be a, a, um, an all-encompassing uh, victory and reward 
it's not going to be we're running and, and barely make it to third base. That's cheap. That's not at all what God is saying. We're going to enter in with um, accolades, and it's going to be a grand thing. The white color evokes a thought of mercy, purity, equity, and judgment, the glory of God, victory, vindication with holiness, and the color of heaven. All these, <clears throat> all these concepts are inspired by the, the white and black theology prominent in the Bible, which conveys the interchangeable notions of, of for the white is vitality and life and light and holiness and joy, which is contrasted by the dark as bl black as being darkness, evil, and sorrow on the other side. The white garments they wear are consistently related in revelation to people who are faithful with God. <clears throat> so a crown is an obvious reference to a shared rulership. That's what the crown means. Doesn't mean we just made it. But angels don't get it. Angels do not receive a crown. They don't get crowns. You go back to Revelation 2. It's not that the angels, um, it's not to the angels it says, to him that overcomes, will I give them Will I put them over the nations? He didn't say that about the angels because they don't overcome. They're angels. Or to him that overcomes, they will sit with me on my throne. He didn't say that to the angels. Jesus doesn't say that to the angels. They don't get crowns. They're already in white because that's the color of heaven. And believers made white means it's like the required form of dress in heaven. And that's what you're going to be dressed in when you make it to heaven. You're part of his body, the divine council. But our status is actually higher than the angels. And again, that takes us back to Paul. He says, and I just said this verse while ago. Sometimes I repeat myself because I, I, I get excited. Uh, Paul said, don't you know that someday we're going to judge the angels? Someday we're going to judge the angels. That's part of what our victory is going to be. These are all pieces, again, of a bigger picture. Um John chooses, John chooses, let's see, John's careful, let's go back just a little bit. John, John's careful choice of term to designate the crowns of the elders points to this direction. Um, diadem, or um, which we get from an English word, and, and or the term with a limited reference to royal authority, uh, which is Stephanus, which is capable of expressing more concepts, including the idea of victory. So what he's saying here is the crown that the, the, um, the, the Hebrew word for crown that John is using when he says that about crown in Revelation comes from the um, Stephanos rather than diadema. And Stephanos doesn't just mean the crown. Stephanos um, leads to the idea of victory, the idea of ruling authorities, victory in battle and ruling authority. So it's a much bigger picture than just receiving a crown because you made it. Um, because, let's see, if it was diadema, that's only about rulership. But with that term, one of which is victory, that makes good sense because he's talking about those who overcome. It's a divine victory for us. Uh, and I don't do much Hebrew and Greek because I just don't get into that kind of thing very much. But I thought that was interesting that the word that John uses to talk about the crown in Revelation not only applies to rulership, but it applies to victory as well. The language shows up in Isaiah at the end of days. Yahweh will be approved by his elders. In other words, this council already exists that we're going to be on. And now believers are moved into this. Uh, we haven't even gotten into the divine council in Revelation 4 and 5. We're still in the letters. But if you look that far, you're going to see a variety of ways to refer to believers as co-rulers inheritors of the status of membership in the divine council. Um, let's move into something in verse 5. He says, I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father 
and before the angels. The book of life is a phrase that occurs six times in Revelation. So you get it here in verse five and then in then the other uh, five places. But we all go, but we go all the way back to Mesopotamia when something was called the Tablets of Destiny. And the fundamental ideas behind the Tablets of Destiny were that you had the gods, in other words, uh, who made decrees and that they decreed destiny. They determine what's going on. They interact with people at that level. It's a very old idea that John is talking about here in Revelation. But remember, and I'm, I'm really strictly right now talking about the physical side of what John is writing in Revelation. We've talked about the spiritual side up to this point, And these are just some physical facts that you might find interesting. It's a very old idea, and it's connected to God's bureaucracy, God's council, his assembly, and the whole record-keeping thing. God wrote all those names in there beforehand, and once they're written, we think that God can't unwrite them, that he can't erase them. But that's obviously not the truth. Was Israel the elect? Was is, were all the people in Israel? If, 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 the book, if the names were written in the book, if the names were written in the book of life in the Old Testament... Because they were God's elect, wouldn't you think that they would be written in the book of life? They were his elect. They were his chosen. That's obvious. But we find out in Revelation, you remember me talking about the synagogue of Satan? That's a bunch of Jews who are turning in their fellow brethren. Remember that from last time? They're Jews. Do you think they've been unwritten in the book of life? So it's not like a one-time deal. You get your name written in the book of life, and then that's it. It can't be changed, can't be unwritten, can't be rewritten again. It's what, what John is saying is, by these, uh, by these verses here, he's saying that there's been multiple examples from Genesis to Revelation where people have been in the book of life and their name erased out of the book of life. And then brought back into the book of life. Revelation, all of Revelation is saying to these churches, you, you were there. You've lost your first love. And if you don't come, I'm going to come and remove. I mean, if you don't repent, I'm going to come and remove my candlestick. He's saying, this is fluid. This is fluid, which, which compares with our journey, that our journey is fluid. These are not hard, fast rules that can't be changed. God is not that way. Do you remember when Moses went up into the mountain and right before he came back down from the mountain, the, the children of Israel had built a golden calf out of their jewelry and God said to Moses, get on down there because I'm about to destroy all of them. And Moses appealed to God the Father and said, oh God, please don't do that. And he prayed and he tarried with God and tried to talk God into not killing all the children of Israel that had built a golden calf and were worshiping it. And you know what the Bible says about God? It, said God, it says God repented of the idea of killing all the children of Israel. He changed his mind. Let you in on a little secret. God can do anything he wants to because he's God. He's God. And all we got to do is read his book and find out his nature. And then direct our lives according to his nature. That's our responsibility. Okay. Um, let me see. Oh, I have so many great notes, but I just can't do them all today. So I'm going to fumble through some of them. Um. So it's a loyalty idea. Um, if you're loyal, you remember in Revelation where it, it talked to these different churches and, it, and once they were there, but they had not remained loyal to him. They had left their first love. They had allowed this woman Jezebel to come in and, and they had um, promoted the, the doctrines of, of Balaam and Balak. And so, so they were there. They, they were loyal to God at one time, but they had drifted away. They had strayed away. You have this believing loyalty among these people. And in Revelation's case, it's loyalty to the gospel. That's what John's telling them. You can't do this. 
You can't just you can't just go off in these tangents and start worshiping somebody else. You've got to remain loyal. You've got to stay the path. You've got to stay the course. You keep believing. That's the only issue. That's the book of life instead of that's the book of life issue right there that you have to stay aligned with the gospel. You believe in the gospel for everlasting life and you don't believe in anything else and you grow in the word of God. You don't throw your loyalty anywhere else. You don't throw your loyalty to a false doctrine in a denomination if it's not in agreement with the word of God because that will rob you of heaven. It will cause your crown. Did I just read? Don't let your crown be stolen. It will rob you of your crown. It will rob you of your victory. You turn your back on all of them and align yourself right here to the cross and the, and, and the resurrection, and you will live with Jesus one day. You will live with Jesus. Election did, I just said this, election didn't guarantee eternal life for the Israelites. Those Israelites, those Israelites, uh, some of them fell in the wilderness because even though God didn't kill them all right then, a journey that should have taken them 21 days to go from the Red Sea to the Promised Land, 21 days, took them 40 years. You know why it took them 40 years? Because God said, because if you're grumbling and complaining and doubting and lack of faith, none of you which left Egypt is going to see the promised land except Joshua and Caleb. Every person who left Egypt over a course of 40 years of living life died in the wilderness except Joshua and Caleb. They were the only two that made it to go into the promised land. Now, all of those people who died in the wilderness, their children got to enter the promised land. That's who Joshua and Caleb took in. But all of those people that grumbled and complained and walked in fear and, and, and oh my goodness, they said, why have you brought us here, Moses? At least back in Egypt, we had food to eat. At least we had A, B, C, D, and E. We can't be that way. We can't grumble and complain because if we do, we're not staying the path. Jesus hates grumblers or complainers. I know I've shared this with you before, but I got to stick it in here. The, a bunch of them got mad because they didn't have meat to eat. All they had was manna. They were grumbling because all they had to eat was manna. So God says, okay, I'll send you meat. He sent enough quail to fill 10 hundred pound barrels of quail. They all got to eat meat. But you know what the word says about it? that those who grumbled and complained died while the meat was still between their teeth. You don't get to grumble and complain on your path to victory. You don't get to grumble and complain. Do you know people who fuss and grumble and complain all the time? They're not on the right path. Do you know people who walk in fear all the time? They're not on the right path. Do you know in Revelation 21 where it talks about um, the people who are going to have their part in the lake of fire? Uh, let's see. I forgot what verse it is, or I would read it to you. I believe it's in 21. Um, no, right here it is. It's, var it's verse 21, yes. Um, 21, 7. Have you heard this before? He that overcometh shall inherit all things. How in the world... Can people get some of the false doctrines they get when the word is this clear? It just blows my mind. Then he lists all the people who are going to have their part in the lake of fire. Guess who's number one? The fearful. The fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the whoremongers, the sorcerers, the idolaters, the liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. He names the fearful with all those folks and puts the fearful number one. If you walk in fear, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God because fear is the absolute opposite of faith. Just the way it is. Let me see. Uh, we talked about that. Uh, let me see. It's just 10 after 3, so I'm doing better than I thought. I thought I'd go to 3.30. Let me see if there's anything else in here that I want to share with you before I go. Um, I want, I had shared with y'all um, several times that, that I take a lot of information from a book that Milton Green wrote um, called The Great Falling Away Today. And... Uh, if you want to read it, go to the website 
that's entitled Be Fruitful and Multiply. And you will be able to find his book called The Great Falling Away Today, and you can order it. It's a marvelous book, and you will use that book in uh, teaching and helping other people for years to come. Magnificent book. Um, the other person that I take a lot of help from, because this guy is, he, he, he's a Bible scholar, and he has just unbelievable details of the physical and the scholarly side of the Bible that I know very little about. So I take a lot of that side from him. And his name is Michael Heiser. And um, I want to read a quote from him from one of his uh, uh, recordings that he did because I think this is just awesome. Uh, I marked it to read to you today. He says, I'm just going, I'm just doing traditions at random here. For example, I got baptized in church, I got sprinkled, I got this, I got that. I was made a member of the covenant community. This is a sign and a seal of the covenant. Well, it is, but you don't have eternal, eternal life because of signs and seals. Those are things that, you, that put you into a community where you can hear the gospel. But guess what? You have to believe it. And you've got to keep believing it. You can't just pray a prayer or go through a confirmation and say, well, boy, I passed that benchmark. Now I can do whatever I want. I can believe whatever I want. I can believe in no God at all. I'm in. I'm good. I can just think and believe and do whatever I want. Wrong. It's just wrong. And it's not that you're meriting salvation. It's not a works salvation. That's not what we're talking about. Forgiveness of sins is grace, and it's free. But the Bible also says faith without works is dead. You have your part to do. The Bible says after having done all, then stand and see the salvation of the Lord. And see, we haven't been taught that. We haven't been taught that we have work to do. We don't earn grace by works. Grace is free. But we have works to do to fulfill our obligation of walking in a right way with God. For, for Christ being formed in us. For regaining that image that was stolen from us in the garden. It's a continued belief. It is a continued believing loyalty in the one thing that will give you everlasting life. And it ain't, it ain't you. It ain't about what you do. It's about faith and your act that your works you're actively moving to deal with all of the just like the children of Israel did they went into the promised land and they had to tear the giants down one at a time they had to kill the giants well you have giants on the land of your heart you have a giant of pride you have a giant of greed you have a giant of lust you have a giant of impatience you have a giant of fear you have a giant of frustration you have a giant of of uh, negativity you have a giant of grumbling and complaining see those are all giants on the land of our heart and if we don't do our part to tear those giants down, no different than the children of Israel having to go up and fight those giants to remove them off the land, they'll kill us. We'll never enter in. We have to do our part. Grace is free, but we have to do our part in order to purify, to become white, to earn that white robe. It's a walk of faith. It's to him who overcomes. How many times have we just read? Matthew, Daniel, Revelation. It's to him that overcomes that shall be saved. You're not saved if you don't overcome. You get your sins forgiven and you start your journey. But if you don't overcome, you're not saved in the end. And it's a journey. Uh, let's see. In real time, when John's writing, when John is writing these letters, Gentiles are coming to faith. We have these churches in Asia Minor, and they are the people of God. They are a new Israel reborn, and guess who they are? But they're Gentiles. 
And John, just like Paul, would say to these Jews, you should have expected this. The Jews should have expected this and not opposed it. But here they are in these churches. This synagogue of Satan is a bunch of Jews who is opposing it. And God is calling them down on it. He's saying, don't you worry about them. I'm going to deal with them. You just keep traveling. You just keep coming to the light. Because you, he says in verse 10, because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those that dwell on the earth. If we just keep believing, we're going to be in the ark and we're going to be protected and taken care of. Um, the one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of God. All these things point to the same thing. The names that we get, he's going to put the name of God on us, the name of the new Jerusalem on us, the name of the city of Zion. This naming points to God being present. God's ownership over the believer. Those believers that get the new name, the hidden manna, the white stone, the white garments, that is the new Israel. And you know what? You know what? Um, Romans. It's Romans. You know what Romans 2.28 says? Let's see. Here we go. This is for you and me. Unless you're a Jew watching. I love you if you are. God bless you. Uh, if you're a Gentile watching, this is for you. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. That's you and me. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not of the letter. Whose praise is not of man, but of God. Did you get that? In the New Testament, in Romans... He is not a Jew who is one outwardly, who is a Jew outwardly, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly. So we, can, we are grafted in. We, are, we have become the elect. Just like when Jesus first began with Abraham and they were his elect, they were chosen. We are chosen, even as Gentiles. We are becoming the elect and we are chosen of God. All of these things which you see in the book of Revelation about getting a new name and having the presence of God with that new name. In the Old Testament, there are references to the end of days, newly redeemed, brought back Israel. In Revelation, they're said of these churches. These things are said of these churches. And, and these churches in Revelation are predominantly Gentiles. They're not predominantly Jews. It's not tied to any ethnicity or anything like this. It's what I just read you. A Jew is one who is of the heart, which means that you have a pure heart before God. Okay. Praise you, Jesus. This is your destiny. It's maybe difficult right now with the times that we're living in. I may have busted a couple of bubbles today. If it's from the Word of God, I hope I did. Because all we want is the Word. We don't want anything but the Word. I think for us that all these things are a great reminder that we are ultimately headed to a shared membership, a joint role with Jesus in the council, and we are participants in that assembly with him at the end of days. And that's what Revelation is all about. So we've completed the great reprimand of the churches. And if there's any theme that has come out of all of this, it's, it's only to those who endure to the end that will be saved. I, I, I see some good things you got going on, but I have someone against you. You need to repent. It's only to those who overcome will I grant to sit with me in my throne? That's what the very last thing is said to the church, the last church in chapter three, 
to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. You want to sit with Jesus in his throne? He says, that's required even as I overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. God bless you all. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your anointing. Thank you for your power. Thank you for truth. Thank you, Father, for splitting into the traditions of men that are not based in Scripture. Thank you, Jesus, for leading us and guiding us, giving us a new hope and giving us peace in a troubled time. Thank you for the ark, Jesus. Thank you that we can enter into you, Jesus, and we are just as safe as Noah was in that ark because the flood is coming. Thank you, Father. We love you, and we give you praise. God bless you all. We'll see you tomorrow night on the conference call with Heather and me.